So the last thing we were looking at was this uh, cascade connection, yeah. So this was the last uh, sort of topic in passivity that we were doing. So you will have your tutorial of course, so hopefully you will have a bit more clarity. What we were seeing is if you have a passive system which is actually driving a stable system, then the passivity property is retained, okay. And you know that once you have passivity property and zero state observability, then you can construct a stabilizing feedback, okay. So we have already seen this, yeah. So uh, along with backstepping, this is a, a very, very strong, uh, you know, method for designing controllers, right. So this becomes a, another rather, rather powerful tool, yeah, in your arsenal, okay. So we also saw these examples, of course, we saw the, uh, you know, robot example, right, which was the case where you were talking about feedback passivation, right, that was the robot case. Then you also uh, looked at the ro rotational dynamics, yeah, I tried to explain a little bit what these MRPs are and so on, but again like I said, we are not so uh, concerned by how these kinematics are formed and so on, we are more interested in just working with the equations, yeah, because this is not a dynamics course, so we are not trying to explain the uh, equations, but as you can see it is, this, this kinematic system was being driven by uh, the omega. Right. So, omega can be thought of as a control, omega is of course the angular velocity and the angular velocity dynamics along with the output was this part, alright. So, this was so and we of course uh, saw or at least well you were supposed to prove that this is um, in fact passive, right, this is a passive system with this um, input and of course some modified output. Yeah, so there is this feedback passivity and passivity are more or less identical. Yeah, because if you apply a feedback, you get a new control with which you can get passivity. Okay, so you had this passive system with output omega, and this output is driving this kinematics. All right, and we figured, of course, uh, well, I mean, I asked you to figure that how you can select a controller and so on. Yeah, and in fact, the control structure was also very obvious. Right, for this cascade case, the structure is actually given in this. Uh, you know how we work this out, right? The structure is right here, right? And that is exactly what we had here, right? And uh, all I asked you asked you to do in your exercise was to choose a particular W function. This W was essentially the Lyapunov candidate for the kinematic system, and I asked you to choose this particular W. And this again comes from the motivation for this is from the kinematics, yeah, from the MRP formulation, yeah. So do not worry about how I got this, I did not get this magically or anything like that. Folks who came up with the modified Rodriguez parameters and started working with it for control design came up with this, okay, so not me, alright. So um, all I asked you to do was use this W here and take the partial and you get a controller, okay. So now you of course have uh, already posted on Moodle, you have your exercise, right, which is this problem and the robot problem. So these are as real as they get, right, you have a robotic manipulator system, you have a rigid body attitude control problem. So you have both these problems and you have been given some numerical data of course, what is the inertias and you know so on and so forth, link lengths and things like that and you are asked to actually do the control, of course complete the exercises and formulate the control and implement it in code, okay. So you are expected to run simulations, all of you should have different looking plots, not same plots try different initial conditions, yeah, I want the plots to look different, they should not be the same, okay. And that should give you enough exposure to, uh, in fact I have also asked you, because we have not done any exercise on backstepping, I have also asked you to do a bit of a backstepping design for the robotic system at least. And so this gives you enough exposure to the two key methods of control design we have learned, yeah. And really, really, I, I hope if, if nothing, Antonio's lecture should have impressed upon you that uh, almost every system you can think of is passive, yeah, everything is just an energy input output equation. The only thing you need to be careful about is what is the output to choose or if you have to do some feedback passivation, that is you have to add some term to the control to make it input output passive, yeah. But this passivity seems like it's free because it just relies on um, in fact, it doesn't even rely on dissipativity, right? If there's no dissipation, you still have the 
less than equal to but if you have dissipation you have the strict inequality and you know, strict passivity and passivity yeah but in all the uh, you know cases that we have been working on and which mostly Khalil uh, the textbook of uh, nonlinear systems focuses on is uh, just passivity he is not looking for strict passivity because the strictness can be introduced using the feedback right I mean you can always add, add a negative definite term you will get your strictness no problem so the strictness is not you know a limiting factor yeah so that should give you a good enough exposure if you can do this um, you know assignment well you simulate you can get good plots you would have I mean I would think you would have learned enough in terms of control design yeah non-linear control design you will be able to pick up a system I mean you may have some hiccups here and there but you'll be able to pick up a system and design a controller okay you'll be able because these are two uh, very very far reaching uh, tools yeah in fact backstepping uh, and passivity also are very closely related because you can use the backstepping ideas to if you remember the idea of backstepping was to just get CLFs right if you keep adding systems you keep getting more newer CLFs right so you can use those CLFs as storage functions for the passivity so it also helps you construct storage functions yeah you might be able to use that storage function to gauge passivity and then do a design yeah so these things can also be combined in a very nice way all right okay in general the control that you design with passivity ideas will be simpler than backstepping anyway you will see that yeah you will see that in your assignment all right great i was reading some reinforcement learning stuff yeah, this is a good thing. You should also try to read. I mean, this is an article which basically connects reinforcement learning to adaptive control. So, so basically, reinforcement learning is uh, control, nonlinear control in some sense. Yeah. Um, so, if you try to do any uh, real-time learning, because mostly most of the learning that you learn in courses, you will see that it's offline because it's really data intensive. But if you want to do real-time learning, because that's where you want to go. Um, because um, if you do offline learning with some data set and then if your real conditions don't meet that data set for example you did all your exercises in the in the daytime all your data was connect, collected with a manipulator or with a quadrotor in the daytime and did you did amazing learning <laughs> of all your vision data you did exceptional work and then if you fly the quadrotor even in the dusk not just not even night if you fly it in the dusk time when the light is a little bit lesser or different your uh, you know your learning will fail yeah so there has to be some online learning also so reinforcement learning is actually feedback based learning right so it's actually sort of connected so anyway i was also reading stuff okay um great so what we want to do is uh, go to sort of the uh, last key topic uh, last key uh, compulsory topic in this course which is on feedback linearization feedback linearization is also a design control design method yes um, one of the older I would say oldest control design method does not rely on any Lyapunov theory at all there is no Lyapunov theory here it relies on uh, vector fields and flows and things like that um, therefore the theory is a little bit more complicated yeah so I spend a little bit more time on this uh, but it's a very powerful tool in the sense that if you uh, once you know how to use it you can actually simplify your control design to a large extent okay so what's the motivation okay let's look at it just the pendulum yeah, I keep bringing up the pendulum example it's such a nice example for a lot of ex uh, situations right if you look at the pendulum this is the dynamics right for this whatever pendulum that I've drawn here and if I write it with this you know state space notation I get something like this right very standard nonlinear system I mean actually a simple nonlinearity but still a nonlinear system now if I choose this feedback what is this doing is basically cancelling this nonlinearity you are used to doing this by the way and we have been inadvertently doing this in all our everything we've been doing right we cancel this nonlinearity so what do I get I get a double integrator which is why I kept saying a lot of times to you that uh, most mechanical systems look like double integrators are double integrators now for this system it seems rather simple let become a double integrator it's a linear system right so what did you do you use a feedback transformation what we call this is called a transformation because you used a feedback to construct a new feedback right 
we did this in passivity also we did this in backstepping also okay so uh, but the purpose of this feedback transformation is to linearize the system or make the system linear i will not use the word linearize because by that you have a different connotation you think jacobian and all that we are not doing any jacobian here yeah we applied a feedback which basically cancelled the non-linearities okay um, and therefore you have a linear system as an outcome what is the good thing about it you can use linear control principles to now drive this system yeah i can even use uh, you know whatever uh, frequency domain methods i can specify overshoots and all the nice things that people know about frequency domain methods right so uh, so therefore you have a lot more uh, you know sort of uh, playground to play with that everybody knows all right yeah which is the motivation to look at feedback linearization to begin with okay now if i go back and look at say for example a slightly more complicated system uh, which is say the robot dynamics yeah if you look at this system yeah it's not very obvious how it is uh, feedback linearizable but it's not that bad because you already know that uh, this is an invertible matrix right this mass matrix or the inertia matrix is an invertible matrix right we know that so i can of course put in the inverse everywhere right everywhere i get an inverse excellent then i can write this as q1 dot is q2 q2 dot is the entire right hand side right with an inverse now if i use my control to cancel all of this stuff out just cancel it right so i can apply a control you can see which is cq q dot q dot plus dq dot plus gq that will cancel everything right and then uh, with a new control say m times v right then m inverse and m cancels out again becomes identity and then i just have q double dot is v again a double integrate okay very simple in these cases it's very simple why because things are evolving in nice cartesian coordinates that's why this looks very simple okay but there are more complicated examples also one such example is again something we've seen this guy okay this is also feedback linearizable right we are not it's not evident how yeah because if you see here the nonlinearity is where in the kinematics right whatever nonlinearity is here it's easy to handle right i can always cancel this right cancel the nonlinearity using the control i'm done so this becoming linear too easy no problem the problem is that this is nonlinear then how do you make the entire system linear looking okay but the fact is this system is also feedback linearizable yeah the question is how do you look at, what are the new states in which it is linear okay so feedback linearization is uh, combined with state linearization okay so you also have a state transformation and a feedback transformation typically okay it's not just application of a feedback okay remember that whenever we talk about linearization feedback linearization although the topic is called feedback linearization actually we are also doing state linearization which means you are choosing appropriate state transformation yeah these transformations are non linear transformations okay not easy linear transformations okay so anyway let's look at let's go forward and see so anyway yes uh you mean the other lecture yeah here i think we discussed this a little bit i mean this is again a dynamical systems notion not a control theory notion <laughs> but uh, because it's a dynamical it's a mechanical system that's why i can say all this kinematics is just see rho in this case represents angles actually it's actually a representation of orientation right so it is sort of a position variable if you think about it angular position variable so anything that gives you angular velocity the, the derivative of angular position this is always called kinematics okay same in robots right what is robot kinematics it is the relationship between the uh, the joint velocities and the uh, end effector velocity yeah so x dot y dot z dot versus q1 dot q2 dot q3 dot yeah you have this jacobian equation and all that if you have seen robotics courses you have a relationship between these velocities and this so this is exactly what this is right there is relationship between body angular velocity and the rate of the 
orientation variable yeah the variable is complicated and nonlinear because if you remember rotation is represented as a matrix and this is just a parameterization so it's complicated but still it's still a rotation variable okay so anything that gives you rotation rates as a relation with the body rates it's a kinematics because it's relating position derivatives okay and then anything that gives you velocity derivatives this is the angular velocity derivative this is dynamics this is the dynamics of the system okay it's just actually uh, terminology nothing more huh? so this is the dynamics of the system and typically this is where the force and the moments and all these appear yeah all right um, great now so that was the motivation that we can actually uh, get rid of nonlinearities of some systems yeah uh, in more often than not the you, we can only get rid of the nonlinearity partially only in some states not in all the states okay uh, but we want to explore when how at or how much can we do okay that's the whole idea so we start as usual with this nice control affine system we are used to this right that the system is basically affine in the control uh, these are f and g are all in rn so states are in rn so f is a n vector g is an n vector yeah we already know this is called a drift vector field this is called a control vector field here i have written in this way where there is only one control it's a scalar in, like a single input system you can of course generalize it yeah just makes the presentation very complicated therefore i have restricted to single input case and everything is smooth right all i have assumed all the nice properties notice also that this theory is very very painful to present and talk about even if explicitly time appears here hmm? time appearing will make this whole thing very very messy yeah so invariably most almost all feedback linearization theory that you will see is for time invariant systems or autonomous systems okay actually a lot of theories that we do is for that only yeah? uh, that's why methods like backstepping and so on are powerful because uh, they will work irrespective of time varying and all is irrelevant yeah it will work anyway all right excellent so we are focusing on control affine systems autonomous control affine systems single input n states all right great now uh, let's not worry about this guy so i mean i was just trying to work out what these are but i'm not going to do it now we already know this notation but i'm going to repeat this notation uh, what is the lee derivative i hope you know this notation yeah what is the lee derivative if you have a function which is a map from rn to r okay we are doing everything in cartesian coordinates the same things can be done in geometric spaces also geometric manifolds also but we are not doing any of that uh, if you have a map from rn to r yeah everything is smooth by the way smoothness is a given yeah uh, and if you have a function f from rn to r yeah then lfh okay um, that is the lee derivative this is the lee derivative of h with respect to f is just partial of h with respect to f times f yeah we've already seen this notation in this uh, when we were talking about the sontag sussman universal formula and things like that yeah this notation is pretty standard yeah so all this and and remember h is a scalar valued function yeah this this notation works only for scalar valued functions if it's not scalar valued this is not the correct notation i mean this notation is still used if h is not uh, scalar valued but then it means something else hmm? so lfh is the lee derivative of a scalar valued function with respect to a vector field yeah f is a vector field yeah it's the drift vector field to be specific yeah that's how we are using this notation yeah it's just partial of h with respect to x f of x that's it that's the formula uh, yeah, and, and you've already seen i mean we have not talked about controllability or anything but you've already seen that these lee derivatives play a big role in the universal controller design they are they form key terms in this universal controller design so obviously these are very important quantities okay that's lfh then we have what is called a lee bracket okay this is actually a bilinear not a bilinear uh, well it's a bilinear operation but it's a bracket operation okay uh, this is uh, again we're not going into too much of details <laughs> you can look at more details if you want 
uh, I have I've taken notes from Ravi uh, or, or little bit of bits of his notes. Uh, you will see that there is more material other than that. So I've taken bits of notes from him and he has taken it from this book. Yeah, this is the absolute uh, Bible when it comes to feedback linearization. Yeah, for this topic, Alberto Isidori's book is the final word. Huh? Uh, pretty classical book by now. So, what is the Lie bracket? It's a bracket operation. That is, it takes two vector fields. Yeah, here we had a scalar field and a vector field. That is, a scalar valued function and a vector field. Here we take two vector fields. And what is the Lie bracket? It simply is this operation. Dgx fx minus dfx gx. Okay. What is this dgx dfx? This is the Jacobian. Okay. Just the Jacobian. If you this is basically this is how it's written yeah but why i have used capital d uh, instead of writing it like this yeah, i have tried to make a distinction here because here h was a scalar valued function so this what is the dimension of this guy anybody what is the dimension of del h del x h is scalar valued x is n vector huh? yeah so typically the way i look at it is is as a one cross n a row vector huh? i always look at it as a row vector it's your call how you want to <laughs> look at it because if i look at it as a row vector then this multiplication makes sense right del h del x fx makes sense yeah otherwise there is a little bit of a problem right or you can look at it as an inner product between the two also yeah anything is fine your call you can look at it both as vectors and you can look at this as an inner product between the two yeah same deal uh, fg is basically dgf minus dfg uh, i don't write it like this i use this because g is actually now a uh, vector valued function right it's a vector field right so this will be a matrix an n by n matrix now hmm? so you can see that um, this uh, if you take the Lie bracket of two vector fields, you get another vector field. Right? What is a vector field? It is just giving you vectors as functions of state. That's it. That's why it's called a vector field. Yeah. It's like saying that I take a point here, I get a vector. I get a. Uh, I think we discussed this also, right? If if you take this sort of space, and you have these many points, at every point I get a vector. This is a vector field. Okay, it actually tells you how, in what directions the systems can move. Yeah, we don't talk about controllability again, but it's well understood that if you have the drift vector f and the control vector g, then you can also move in the f comma g inner uh, Lie bracket direction. You can make the system move in this direction also. Yeah, so you see, right? I got a new direction to move in. Right, so it's almost like saying I have a car, right? Uh, I am saying that I can turn right by 90 degrees uh, or I can go straight. I can only do two things with this particular car of mine. But then just by those two operations, I can also do the Lie bracket operation, which I don't know. It may be some other direction, maybe 35 degrees in between. Yeah. So, so it's actually telling you that you can actually move uh, in directions that are beyond the vector drift vector field and the control vector field directions right because naturally if you look at this expression it would seem to you that you can't right seem it at least intuitively it seems like this is just a scalar multiplying g right so you're just moving in span of f and g it looks like right you can only move in f direction and g direction right but but it can be shown that you can also move in f comma g direction in the Lie bracket direction. Again, this is not something we are looking at right now. Yeah, let's not worry about it. Uh, but that's why these are important. Yeah, because these actually give you new directions to move in. Yeah, and that's why it determines controllability of a system. Right? As many directions, if you can move in all the directions, if you have three dimensions, you can move in all three directions. You're done, which means you have controllability. Right? At every point. But um, so, Lie derivative very critical whenever we are looking at all these potential functions and the derivatives of potential functions along some uh, direction along a dynamical system, right? Lie bracket because it talks about 
new directions in which your control system can move. Yeah. So this is what forms the basis of all of feedback linearization. Okay. Like I said, I take with permission Ravi's notes. Uh, so this is the system again. Some I mean here he has specified some open set and so on. Let's not worry about it. Uh, so uh, if you take some output of the system now, okay. I am, you can see I have repeatedly used the same notation for the functions. I denote the output as h of x. Okay. If I take some output h of x, okay, then what is the derivative of the output? If I take the total derivative of the output, that is y dot, what will it be? It will be partial with respect to h, partial of h with respect to x, right, times the dynamics x dot, which is fx plus gxu. So that will be what? So if I actually write it out, so y dot is partial with respect to x, yeah, and this guy is actually LFH, the way I have defined it, this is LFH, right. So you need to get used to this notation and this along with this is LGH, right. So that is why y first derivative is LFH plus LGH times u, okay, alright. So that is pretty simple, okay. This is how the first derivative goes, okay. If I take the second derivative, now let us try to see what happens if I take another derivative, yeah. It is pretty simple because I will keep writing in the same notation, yeah. If I take derivative of this, uh, it will again be partial of this with respect to x times fx plus gxu, yeah. But that is basically going to be the same as saying lf square h plus lgf lfh times u, okay. You can work it out, it is very easy, yeah, because it is just partial with respect to x and then you multiply by lgf, so it is actually pretty straightforward, okay. So, uh, and so this will be the second derivative, okay. This will be the second derivative, yeah. So uh, if I keep doing this on and on, yeah. Uh, so one of the assumptions that we typically make uh, is of a relative degree of a system, all right. What is the relative degree of a system? Exactly defined by this, that Lg Lfk Hx is 0 for all k from 0 to r minus 2 and it is non-zero for k equal to r minus 1, okay. This is called a relative degree of the system. It is nothing very complicated, uh, it is very straightforward. It just tells you how many times I have to take the derivative of the output to get the input in the equation, okay. So that is why I have actually taken this example. If you see this, this pendulum example. Okay, let us take this example, yeah. Suppose I take my y as y equal to hx as the first state, x1, okay. What is the, what is LFH by the way? LFH is, first I take partial with respect to x, so it is 1 comma 0, the row vector, okay. Then I multiply it by the f. What is f? f is the drift vector field this guy, right, the one without the control is f, the one with the control is g, right. So I just multiplied it with x2 and this whatever minus g sin x, g over l sin x1 will be here and the product is what, just x2, right, is that clear, yeah, this has to make sense to you, huh? this is very simple, this does not make sense, you will have trouble later, yeah. All right, great. Uh, now, if you see, when I took my y and I took its derivative, all right, um, I have not computed an LGH. Okay, what is the LGH? Let us compute the LGHX also. It is the same thing, 1, 0 multiplied by G. G is what? The control vector field. It is 0, 1 over ML square, right? That is this guy and the product is 0, okay. So what does it mean? 
it means that y dot I mean I, all this effort to do one y dot is actually equal to x1 dot is equal to x2 you see that is the same x2 that appears here okay? because that is what I did all this expression all these Gli derivatives and so on this guy this guy is just to express the derivative the total derivative of the output subsequent total derivative you see the control does not appear here because LGH is 0. Now let us take the next derivative y double dot second derivative that is what is equal to x2 dot and that is what this guy minus g l sin x1 plus 1 m l squared u. Okay. So, what control is appearing in the second derivative of the output? Okay. Okay. Relative degree is 2. Okay. So, same thing will show up in the Lie derivative also. Now, let us take Lf squared h. Yeah. What is Lf square h? It is basically the you take this as h now and then do an LF again. So, this is del h partial of this with respect to x multiplied by f again. So, partial of this with respect to x is what? 0 comma 1, not 1 comma 0, but 0 comma 1. And if I multiply it with the same guy again, I get the second term, right? And that is this, all right? That is this. Then what? What about LG LF h x? Again, take this as this is the LFH partial with respect to x is 0, 1 again, right? Multiply now by g, the control vector field. So it gives me 1 over ml square, and that is exactly the second derivative, right? Again, this is all this LFH, LG, LFH, all this is notation just to express the total derivative, okay? This notation just makes life, I mean, although as of now you might find the, your life more complicated. But actually, this is supposed to make your life easy when you are doing calculations, okay? Because when you take recursive derivatives, you can't keep doing x1 dot, x1 double dot. I just did a special case, right? How will you write the general case? So, you need this notation, okay? And that's the whole idea. What, what was the condition for relative degree r? It was that Lg Lf k h is 0 from k to r minus 2. Okay. And that is the case for us, for the pendulum example. What did we have? We had uh, our relative degree is 2, so r minus 2 is actually 0. Okay. So, what have we shown? We have shown that LGH is 0, yeah, because this is 0 means this is not there. So, LGH is 0 is what we have shown. right? Uh, and then we also have that LG LFH, r minus 1 is 1 in our case. So, LG LFH is actually non-zero, right? We saw that. And as soon as LG LFH becomes non-zero, you see, I just did this, right? The second derivative contains LG LFH, right? LF square which is non-zero already, but LG LFH is non-zero. So, in the second derivative, control showed up because this term became non-zero. So, this LG, LG LF, LG LF square, they will keep appearing now, okay. This is why this is a little bit more complicated because of the notation, yeah. But the idea is they are just trying to express the derivatives, several rounds of derivation, yeah, which you cannot express otherwise. There is no other nicer way of expressing this than this, okay, because you have a dynamics coming in at every derivative, all right.